Hi there, I'm Tom Field. I'm Senior Vice President of Editorial with Information Security Media Group. And I wanna welcome you to the latest in our cybersecurity leadership series. This is where we bring together CEOs and CISOs to talk about the burning issues of our time. And today, our topic is going to be fraud. A little bit of background on what we're gonna discuss today. According to the ABA's 2019 Deposit Account Fraud Survey Report, there were more than $25.1 billion in fraud attempts in 2018, and fraudsters made off with more than $2.8 billion in stolen money. So with that as context, today we want to address some of the key fraud and payments exposures and how we're responding to and preparing to defend against the impact of fraud scams in an era driven by the necessities of COVID-19. First, let's introduce our CEOs. From one span, we've got Scott Clements. From Bottom Line Hi, Technologies, Tom. we've got CEO Rob Everly. And now let's meet our CISOs. Roger Sells, VP Solutions with EMEA and BlackBerry. Tasha Finnegan, CSO, FMB, South Africa. Dasha Deckworth, CISO, Stealth ISS Group Incorporated and Yelena Zelenovich Matone, CISO and Risk Officer at European Investment Bank. Panelists, thank you so much for joining me here today. Let's start with our first question, and the topic is business email compromise. Now, account takeovers and business email compromises are growing in popularity because scammers have got the sophisticated technological resources and the mechanisms to be convincing in their impersonation of a business or an individual. And in some cases, buying this as a service, they don't even need to be particularly technologically sound. Now, first question I have, Scott, I'd love for you to take this first and others I'd love for you to jump in. What do you find to be the most effective methods to combat this growing threat, business email compromise, and how hard are these solutions to implement, particularly in today's remote workforce? I think in, in answering the question, we have to break the problem down maybe into a couple of pieces. Uh, in the case of spear phishing, it's really about education of employees and separation of duties, the normal things we want to do, I think, in any company. The account takeover case is a little more challenging. 80% uh, of, uh, of these kind of breaches uh, occur be through stolen credentials. Uh, and those credentials either come from, uh, can come from the web, they're just harvested off the web from all of the data losses that have happened over recent years or direct, more directly by phishing attacks. Um, the solutions to uh, these kind of attacks are uh, evolving. Uh, there are the traditional methods of using a multi-factor authentication, uh, preferably not uh, uh, SMS, uh, which has issues of its own. Uh, but then also the implementation of zero trust models, which has become much more common recently. And then I think most importantly uh, is uh, now the application of AI and passwordless methods of uh, security, really eliminating the password through asymmetric security uh, combined with device biometrics, if, if at all possible. And I think when we, as we see the use of AI and the application of passwordless methods, I think it will really take a uh, a lot out of these kinds of attacks will become much harder to accomplish. Also would be to train the users to recognize the attacks. Um, I oftentimes we see nowadays that we have a lot of tools in place. Um, another thing I could say is also monitoring inbox rules um, and all of these we can put in place. But however, we notice again that users and users fall again for the phishing attacks. And all it takes is one. So uh, I've been stressing that on every IT conference, how important it is. And um, it's something that we've been seeing around a lot. Also from my network, I hear a lot. It's, it just takes one and it just has a domino effect. So this training of the users, I, I would say is extremely important. And especially during COVID now that we've seen it diversify the phishing and uh, it, it has gone into number that I cannot believe now. It has really increased. I think that um, we, what we have done uh, is we have increased also the trainings and we have actually tailored the trainings for such events and uh, tailored them so that they understand the phishing attacks, the, uh, the voicemail attacks, SMS attacks that are taking place right now. Um, 
and I would just add because I think you just said a lot in the in your first round already. Um, but I would add this uh, inbox rules as well and look for the technology solutions that uh, can help with it. In that training, I think it's also very important to call out to the users what normal or good looks like um, and, and to emphasize the regular process. Um, maybe if indeed in your company it is normal for your CEO to reach out to Tom in accounting and update uh, payment details, well, then start by already um, improving that process making sure that everybody knows what the process is and putting in, in place a few gates. The real key is not having a single point of failure in leveraging technology. We have a major bank that had a uh, healthcare customer of theirs and our technology was able to determine that while well, everything about the notes requesting gift cards from doctors appeared normal, the fact is gift doctors had never asked for a gift card as a payment type. So our technology was able to look at that from a behavioral standpoint and through our AI determine that's not normal. So you really need to get multiple defenses and go beyond any single point of failure. And leveraging technology is absolutely key. I think the biggest thing we had to look at from our side is uh, user awareness. I mean, I think we spam our users um, and, and customers with training. Uh, you know, it's starting to become how else? And scammers are obviously, all our training platforms are now being taken over by scammers. But we started our process by fixing our internal processes, right? So you wouldn't be necessarily in a situation where there was a, a payment impersonation or a customer impersonation and always that double I principle for verification, line manager approval, I think it became quite onerous um, and we've had to build, uh, agreeing with you, there is a technology platform capability, but we've had to sort of build that uh, behavioral based learning in the background, but it really has become about changing our business processes. I think like most organizations, you know, you start with implementing something because you're achieving a goal, like making money or delivering a service or whatever it may be. And security being the afterthought, you don't really do the business process in the right, correct fashion. You do it with what's going to get you the outcome the quickest. Um, and we found when we started fixing our business processes on the back end, it started to make the technology conversation a lot easier. So where you are having a 12 to 18 month return on investment because of bad business process, or behavioral-based technology learning bad business process as good behavior, because that's what we also started to see, right? We had technologies where improving or proving that this was, you know, good behavior and actually it wasn't. So it is about a combination between the two. I think, you know, there's a reason why they say people process and technology. I don't think you can do one without the other one. And I'll start backward to your people process technology. It's um, we as an assessment company, honestly, when we go look at configuration of mail servers, MX records and all this, it, um, I would say 50% of the companies still are not getting it right. So that opens up, of course, the, the problem of being able to misuse corporate emails by third party. Um, it, it, it is a problem. At the same time, you got open source tools that can just pretend your company X, Y, and Z and you're sending alerts and you're sending emails asking companies to respond to it, pretending to be legitimate. So it's the users, the awareness of the users and also the processes behind it. Um, we've had it multiple times where you know, our clients users responded to an email. Hey, I need your email from a CEO. Hey, I need your, I need you to buy these gift cards. I need you to send out this check, but you know what? I know everybody wants to do the right thing. Everybody wants to be as quickly as possible and as efficient, but we're in the technology world. It does not take two weeks to write a letter to confirm with somebody. Do you really want me to get the gift cards or, you know, pick up a phone, give them a call. And that goes back to, to people, the awareness sometimes double checking is worth a lot more than getting it done 30 seconds quicker than it would have taken. I guess that people tend to be surprised because even with the training, they don't let's say, imagine that the threat will come in through maybe their personal email address or as a text message. And this is when uh, then these um, technology gaps are still there uh, in the first place because some of these assets are out of your view, out of your control. Um, so that, that still 
leaves plenty of room for an adversary to, um, to exploit, I guess. But that's where the training then comes in. I want to move on to our next topic, and the topic is e-commerce and card not present fraud. Now, with online and mobile shopping continuing to rapidly expand and the security measures of EMV chip making physical point of sale fraud more difficult, it's not surprising that fraudsters are moving their game to the digital realm of card not present payments. So my question, Rob, I'd love to start this with you and have everybody else jump in as well. Rob, how do we provide an additional security layer for digital transactions without impacting the customer experience? And what does that look like? The challenge is the customer experience is one that's going to be faster and faster. Payments are going to be faster and faster. And reducing friction in that process is whatever is critical. Same time, how are we protecting fraud? I think an element of that is even if the customer thinks this is what they want to do, at least that's how we approach this in business payments. Do we have that customer's back? And is that in fact what they actually want to do? So even if the instructions right, the identities right, is this a payment that just seems inconsistent from information that we have, knowledge we have? Are they sending a million dollars to a vendor that's never received anything like that or has just been set up recently? So we try to take technology and the information we have and actually protect the customer in a business payment from, from themselves in a way. How can you have technology help the customer even when it's their intended payment that's been being impacted? You know, I think what we're seeing in, in the industry is that this really does come down to uh, data and visibility uh, to data and sharing data uh, between institutions. Our, our angle on these things is mostly related to the banks themselves. Uh, and it's clear that AI tools are going to be the most important here already are because they can operate without really affecting the, the user experience. Uh, it does require, I think, for this to really work well for institutions to collaborate with each other because the bigger the data sets, the better, better the analytics are. I guess that point about the data sets is, is where it will matter if you use algorithmic decision-making um, because, see, the, the customer can surprise you with behavior that you've never seen before. Um, I know that myself during the pandemic, I've gone on VPNs to have a localized version of, let's say, Amazon, because the product that I get uh, when I come in through the US or I come in from my current location um, is going to be uh, different. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to order it there. I wanted to have it shipped um, and then forwarded to me. I can easily see how um, both humans and uh, machines could have qualified that as fraud. Um, and then I think, well, okay, even in payments, you may have uh, certain behavior that initially you can't explain, um, especially now with the, with the pandemic, uh, users suddenly hopping all over the place uh, from an IP point of view. I mean, there's a lot of technology and a lot that allows us users to pretty much, from a behavior perspective, bypass all normal rules, especially with VPN, the travel and all this. Um, there are technologies out there that kind of flag it, especially on the um, on the web and portal side. We have um, we provide some of the services like that. We work with big banks that really have the AI behind it to figure out is this legit? Is this a VPN? Is you know all the behavior? So it's going there. But one thing I would like to throw out: yes, it's a lot of fraud. But from a user perspective, um, if if somebody gets my credit card and misuses it, I'll just call up the bank and get a new one. So it's kind of this, you know, are we as an industry really forcing a change? Because yes, it is on the bank. They have the biggest risk. I know they're now trying to push the risk to the users, but overall from a user perspective, and they would be the ones that initiate the change and require a, a solution but they have it easy. They just call up the phone, get a new card, get whatever was, um, whatever the fraud was, get that money back into their account problem solved. So, it, you know, it, it's a chicken and egg thing. We can't force and improve the technology and invest millions of dollars if the, if the user is okay with the risk or the lack of risk for them. 
it's very difficult. I mean, we try, we are doing the PSD2 introduction. Europe has seen a lot of increase in uh, CMP frauds. Um, I think in 2018, ECB, European Central Bank, also reported that 73% of the frauds are uh, due to this. So it's very hard to not put such controls in place. Um, and um, as somebody just mentioned now, that the technology is there and it's for them it's very easy all they do is request the card so for i, I don't think uh, we it's hard to say it's a chicken and egg <laughs> again as somebody said uh, yes we need to look for the customers we need to ensure that uh, they're secure but we also have to ensure that uh, that customers are happy but at this point I, I don't know maybe it's being a CISO and being biased in this view it is you know what deal with it because we have to put security in place um I think we have come a far way. There's a lot of uh, um, controls put in, as I said, PSD2. Uh, we have multi-factor authentications, uh, something that users possess, something they know and something they are. Um, and it will probably continue to be this way. And it's hard to say how else you can uh, leverage the user satisfaction on this. So I think we're all dealing with the same challenges of COVID. I think the you know, from our perspective, behavioral basis is, is very difficult. We try to drive everything onto our platform um, because that's something we can control and manage in our environment. And we try and manage the behavior on that platform um, as much as we can to that degree. Um, but at this point in time, it really is about user education, fixing the process on the back end, and then utilizing the technology to cover for the gap. I want to move on and talk about authorized push payment fraud. As you know, due to an increased adoption of real-time payments, authorized push payment fraud that sanction ongoing payments to fraudulent recipients is becoming a very common threat. So my question, and Tash, I'd love to start this with you this time. Are our identity access management tools really effective at detecting fraudulent actors? And if not, what other steps can be taken to combat this threat? I don't know which is a uh, biggest swear word in my life, data security or identity and access management. And I would be surprised if anyone in the room doesn't agree with me. Um, <laughs> so uh, to be honest, uh, do I feel that our identity and access management tools are good enough? Um, I think it's a I think it's a very difficult question to answer because I think it's very dependent on every organization. I think like most things, you can't buy a technology that comes out of the box and it solves for your specific business processes and business applications. The same way, I don't think you can buy a technology out of the box that so solves for your customers' different uh, requirements and, and use cases, right? I think everybody um, is unique in their own way. So is the access governance process going to be standard across everything? Absolutely not. I think there are technologies that have really made good inroads and, and um, changes in the way that they approach identity and access governance. Um, and I think that there's obviously a, a new age and a new wave of customer behavioral and customer management in terms of access governance. I think that it's still a journey. Um, and I, and I just don't see it being there today. So is my answer, are they enough? No, but I think we are the problem. I don't think it's the technology. I think a lot of focus is on, is this the person in the action? And it's just as important to say, is the, is the account where this payment's he headed valid and protected? So are we really looking at the receiving side? Is that authentic? Is that where that payment ought to arrive? One of the big things we can do to protect payers, whether the business payers or consumer payers, is to look at where is that payment headed and apply information and technology that even they may not have been considered. You know, this is really uh, an old hack, right? It's maybe one of the oldest ones that we're talking about here today. You know, this is the sort of stranded traveler who lost their wallet that needs some money or the Nigerian prince uh, or a uh, variation on the Nigerian prince or, or just a spear phishing attack obviously can, can drive this. Uh, to the point that uh, Tom made earlier, the difference here is that that things happen so much faster now. You know, a few years ago, you'd have some time before uh, you know payments got settled. Uh, today, those payments are settled uh, in many cases al almost immediately, and that's I think what has made this uh, hack continue to be so attractive uh, to uh, to fraudsters. And uh, and I think again, as as Tom alluded to here, uh, from a technology solution point of view. 
uh, it, it really is going to come down to over time um, analytics tools and machine learning tools that I identify anomalous uh, transaction behavior, uh, transactions that are unusual in their timing or their uh, scope or scale or location or the recipient. Uh, these, are, these are all things that can be clues and one of them individually might not be a sufficient a reason to, uh, to uh, stop a payment or a transaction, but usually and often in these circumstances, more than one of these variables will be unusual uh, that uh, can help you identify when, when things are happening. But it's, uh, I think, early uh, in the use of uh, AI and machine learning for these kinds of use cases. Yeah, AI will help, but um, overall it's still us users that will need to um, need to work with it. I want to talk a bit about synthetic accounts. Now, the creation of synthetic identities has aided the growth of payments fraud. You know that. According to LexisNexis Risk Solutions, 86% of fraud losses experienced by mid to large online retailers involve the use of synthetic ID accounts. So my question, Roger, I'd love for you to take this first. What can be done and what are you going to do to proactively spot breakout fraud transactions and limit the damage from these increasingly fake IDs? Well, it depends on, on a number of, um, of variables, but uh, typically there is some behavior that you can pick up from these accounts um, and from uh, using these identities. Um, you, you may not have the same type of history, not the, the same type of interaction with other accounts. Um, so I think from a behavioral point of view, you can already start noticing a few um, aberrations and, and detect certain patterns that you can um, um, classify as bad and then uh, at least hold these transactions until they can be validated separately. I see it from two sides. So there's the technology solution, which is uh, what, uh, what you just mentioned. And that is key. Yes, you probably can get, um, get some behavior and AI in it to really identify what has been fraudulent. But at the same time, let's not forget, we are currently doing a lot remote, especially now with COVID um, and everything is global. So, and I, I personally had the ex experience, not necessarily because I wanted to, but it just accidentally happened that um, you want to create a new account somewhere, was it a bank account or something? And a lot of the information is just being submitted electronically. And we all know how easy it is to falsify documents. So it's not necessarily so much the technology aspect that is key, but also the process and really physically identifying the people. Are they actually who they claim to be? And is that associated with the right activity? And you can, especially now, I mean, you can create online bank accounts. You can, and especially if we're talking international business here, um, international banking transactions, not everybody is living up to the same standard as we have here in the US to know your customer and validate and double check and triple check. And then six months later, you go through it again. Um, so if you manage to get your identity somewhere else, uh, then who cares about the syn synthetic identities and AI behind it? Once you created an account somewhere, let's say India, which probably is an easy way to identify people or to not really know your customers and um, go from there, then suddenly you have the open market to the rest of the world. So I think that's a big risk from a financial perspective. So people and process right there. But I'd say there's two ways for attacking that. One is, of course, always trying to work on how are we preventing any of these accounts, how are we preventing synthetic accounts, what is the technology to protect that from occurring. But then the second is really assume there are bad guys that have accounts. So analyzing the behavior and analyzing data flow, analyzing transactions, assuming that any one of these accounts Accounts may actually be a synthetic account that's being deployed for fraud. So really two sides trying to do everything you can to prevent synthetic account or uh, account takeover. And second, then the technology to assume that any one of the accounts you have in your organization could be taken over or could be synthetic. What are the things we're doing to, to 
prevent fraud occurring from those accounts. I think it's actually good that you raise the account takeover risk because then you can start to really counteract a number of the measures. Um, you will already have a history. You will already have exhibited certain patterns of behavior. Um, so that's that's going to complicate the detection use case, I would think. I think the, the pandemic uh, has, has really raised the profile of, of synthetic IDs. As, uh, as Dasha talked about here a couple of minutes ago, and it, you know, it's really pushing everything into remote account opening uh, is, uh, is the method. But the underlying cause, I think, is the, um, all of the government uh, payments uh, that have gone out uh, very rapidly in the earlier part of this year, in particular, the PPP payments in the US here, the additional unemployment and stimulus checks. Uh, these all added up to hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, of funds being stolen uh, through the through these different programs. Uh, and and what happens after that is that the uh, the fraudsters have to set up uh, accounts to launder this money. Uh, they set up a mule account so that they can uh, clear and launder launder the money. And I think to what Rob was uh, talking about, uh, we believe that the most important way to address this is by better, uh, better ID proofing on account opening. Uh, that um, we have better technologies now for scanning IDs and identifying if those IDs are not uh, legitimate uh, because of the lack of safety features or other things. But then also the combination of that ID scan with, uh, with information and data about that ID. Um, of course, uh, Hackers are getting better at, at filling out a more uh, backdrop or more background information about these synthetic ideas. But in, in many cases, because they're trying to do this so quickly, um, when you combine the ID scan with the um, uh, sourcing of uh, related data, you can identify uh, these cases in, in many times. I want to move on to the topic of insider fraud. Now, stop and think about this for a minute. We've got remote workers, unmonitored workspaces, economic stress, pandemic fatigue. What are you doing to reduce insider risk? Whether it's the malicious insiders who intend to do harm or the accidental insiders who make a mistake or are taken advantage of by external fraudsters, just as costly, what are you doing to reduce insider risk? It's it's difficult, especially now. Um, I know a lot of companies have not had the infrastructure or even the the laptops to give away to um, to their remote work. So we have a lot of bring your own devices. You have um, honestly, I um, <laughs> the simplest way in form is have a backup. I always have a backup, um, not just a backup plan, but pretty uh, conduct backups. Uh, test those backups. Yes, have monitoring in place. Uh, limit the actions that the user can do. And this is really goes back to basic security. A user is a user. They should not have any admin access and limit the access to only what they need to see I mean, or need to have. It's um, PCI DSS, financial sector, they have it quite straightforward. It's, first of all, if you need to see something is completely different than you can export something or you can delete something or you can manage something. Um, but I've heard that the government is looking at moving some areas of their work into home office. So I'm interested to see how that will play out. But I know that there's already discussions in place, cameras, uh, locks on devices, uh, locks on doors. So basically we're gonna be forced to put in physical controls around our personal homes. I don't think we're quite at a conversation for physical controls, if I'm honest. Um, but I, it wouldn't surprise me. I think uh, we're losing the game in any way. Um, but that's the whole point, right? We've got to catch up. I think from uh, insider fraud catching uh, insider transactions, um, we've trying to do a lot of work around our access governance and processes. Again, it comes back to processes and the users. Uh, where we don't uh, want to drive toxic combinations. In other words, you shouldn't be able to either 
approve and transfer or you know delete or add at the same time so i think it really stems to access governance and access controls um and obviously as a bank and as dasha mentioned as part of pci it's it's something that we are mandated to do um so that's kind of the process we're going through in terms of working from home um Sure, we had to mobilize. I think we had in South Africa, we were given five days notice. So we obviously had preemptive, watch the global pandemic, saw it sort of coming, but really we had five days to mobilize our entire workforce. And um, it really came originally, obviously at some costs, right? I think like, no, no, we're not unique to any other company. There were some trade-offs that we had to make. Um, and what I want to say is, we're a corporate, we, we issue corporate issue devices, but where we had contractors, um, we had to allow for certain other controls, uh, like Dasha mentioned, uh, strict VDI, meet certain criteria, must be connected at X, uh, only allow certain access to X, can't copy out, can only view in. Um, it is around applying the basic uh, controls without allowing access and also limiting the time of access. I do think that working from home from a cyber perspective, um, just moving slightly from fraud, is beneficial and not at the same breath. I think it's really, you know, the attack surface is a lot harder. You have to hope somebody is connected to the network at that time. Compromising a user account is one thing, um, but catching them on the network at the same time is a lot harder. So I think it's made the attacks of a lot harder, but I also think... Um, it's made it a lot easier, right? So now it's about compromising the home user on their home Wi-Fi and compromising the home user via their own social media or their children, like Dasha mentioned, or something like that. So it really is, like you said, the toxic combination. And I think it is coming back to strong access controls. I think that's the, the easiest way to mitigate the, those sort of layers to get in. I'd make a point, a couple points on that. First of all, nobody likes to talk about or think about insider fraud because the feeling is your team, your culture, but you have to take the same serious protections around insider fraud. And I think that the work from home has accentuated the need for this. It's amplified it. But the need to protect against insider fraud has existed long before and it will exist after whatever work from home environment exists. There are a couple ways that our solution gets at that, behavioral analytics and data analytics. So for example, clustering a peer group, is your behavior consistent with what others in your role are doing? That's gonna be fairly independent of where you live. I mean, there may be some ways that you approach work when you work from home in terms of time and things, but the data sets that you're accessing, how you're transferring things, what's being done, that's gonna be consistent. So we can look for anomalies around a, a peer group and clustering around a peer group. The second thing is session replay. The ability to see in a risk management profile to be able to see what happened click by click from that user. And is that something that your investigation abilities allow you to play that back and see, is that a fraud case that um, then can even lead to prosecution? So. The protections needed for insider fraud are even more important today with the work from home environment, but they're always going to be critical because you have to assume there's someone in your organization who has malintent. See, I think the intent needs to be taken into account as well. If it's intentional um, fraud that is being perpetrated, um, then there will be uh, behavioral signs that will be access rights that maybe are too liberal. So these points have been raised before. In unintentional cases with the work from home, okay, the uh, home computer might already have been compromised. Somebody might actually be uh, now seizing the opportunity. I think there are a number of technological solutions there to no longer having to create a VPN with all of these devices and we can create secure containers on devices and separate work from, uh, let's say, um, private uh, data and, and manage the risk from, uh, from that angle as well. I think the remote environment and the, some of the informality that goes along with it, it, it can expose gaps and controls uh, that already existed, but perhaps were less visible. And so I, I think uh, for, uh, for our company, I think the, the most important point is that there's no substitute for good controls uh, in the way that your company operates and, and money money is managed. It doesn't address things like data exfiltration and other uh, other areas where uh, technology has got to be a, a critical part of the answer.
adding to the problem space, everything we've talked about today, the increase in mobile applications and messaging has created a target rich environment for SMS spoofing. What is your best advice for online businesses of all stripes to prepare for these emerging threats in the future? Because the future is now. I think it's a, it's a broad set of issues uh, for sure. And it, it affects not only retailers, but uh, lots of other sectors that are digitizing right now. So telehealth is another one, I think, where there are a lot of things that are being rushed out uh, into the marketplace where there probably is an inadequate attention to security. We see that in almost every case historically, even banks, when they uh, really first started launching a lot of their mobile applications, there were significant gaps, uh, security gaps in those, uh, in those offerings. So I think we see a pattern uh, that uh, repeats here uh, when, when we go through these periods of, uh, of real change. And I, you know, we like to think about this as uh, a war of many battles. Uh, hackers are really using the same technologies that we use to defend against fraud uh, to generate uh, more fraud. And so the, the real, I think, critical notions uh, going forward are that we need to have agile and adaptive security uh, because the threat environment is going to continue to evolve uh, very quickly in ways that we don't expect. And that's why I think you hear so much in the discussion today about AI and, and machine learning and analytics, why they're so important, because they, they can adapt uh, to these situations as things happen. Uh, when we have large data sets and we have adequate data sets where pattern recognition can take place either over uh, longitudinally, so we can see behavior changes in individuals or um, as Rob talked about across groups, uh, so we can see anomalous uh, behavior uh, across many people and groups, or we see anomalous behavior that is repeating across groups, or, or finally, just simply a sharing known bad identities, uh, you know, across institutions can be a big help. You know, I think the SMS question really raises a couple of just bigger themes. So, you know, fraud, I've heard it said that fraud's going to follow speed and popularity or crowds and confusion. Well, we have really a, a major track and trend that's going on in business payments. It's going on in payments of all types. It's faster, it's simpler, it's removed friction from that process. And the requirement then for technology providers like us and those engaged in fraud prevention is to parallel path, have the tools that can address that. We're not gonna change those behaviors. We're not gonna change that push towards faster or easier, newer methodologies the requirements to have at the same time we have the tools that can address that. So I think uh, make sure you educate yourself and really understand. I think today you can't really afford to, as a new business startup, not have some sort of basic fundamental understanding around cyber or fraud, um, around how that's going to impact you. I mean, there's nice, easy guides, but I do think users should take, a, take an interest in that. And then my second piece of advice is just be clear and consistent around how you communicate with your customers and what is your unique identifier and be, uh, be conscious to educate them on that consistent message. So that there, if your general way of communication is X to receive X and authenticate against X, then anything outside of that is already trained bad, right? So just be consistent and clear with your messaging with customers. Security is by, seen by a lot of companies still as an afterthought. And uh, we're trying to change it that it's not really a cost. It's not an afterthought. It's a business enabler. You have to, for your, for your own business sake and for your client's sake, you have to have a security mindset. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So it doesn't matter if you're creating a payment portal or who you, whoever is doing your payments, Make sure you do the due diligence, you select your partners, right? You know what kind of risks are associated to you or the, your clients. And um, if you're developing something in-house, um, make sure you test everything. Make sure you get um, a vulnerability scan, pen test. Make sure you use the right um, software development lifecycle with security in place. You know, those kind of things. I think that's that goes back to security is not a cost anymore. It's a business enabler and businesses need to take that into consideration. Taking that context of the business, um, understanding how it operates 
and then threat modeling across all of the processes of where uh, fraud can, can happen um, is good input that can be shared with experts that can help in, uh, in the assessment and that can then suggest a number of controls that have to be in place. Um, so that would be my advice. Uh, contextualize your risks for your business, review them with spe uh, specialists and, and get them to guide you on uh, which controls to implement. Excellent words with which to close our discussion. I do want to thank each of our panelists today for joining us, for your time, for your insight. Thanks so much for participating. And then for each of you, those of you that, that tuned into this conversation today, we've been talking about fraud and payment security threats. These aren't things that might happen. They aren't things that could happen. They're happening now. Thank you so much for taking time to tune into this latest in our cybersecurity leadership series. I look forward to seeing you next time for topics and discussion points that are just as compelling as what you've heard here today. Again, for Information Security Media Group, I'm Tom Field. Thank you so much for watching us here today.